thank you all for being here. The pleasure is a bit more personal. In about 10 days, I'm going to talk with my second year Canadian politics class about treaty. And we'll start with Treaty 4, which defines the, the, the ground on which we stand. We'll talk about Treaty 6, which is Northern Saskatchewan. We'll talk about the apocalypse that was residential schools. And if the kids are good, and some of them are in the class, so I hope they will, they'll push me on, well, this is the history. How do we honor it and yet move beyond it? How do we not repeat it? So we'll talk about the Niska, we'll talk about James Bay Free, we'll talk about modern land claims. We'll talk about uh, First Nations University here. Perhaps, if I'm lucky, someone will talk about life in North Central, right? We'll talk about the local and we'll talk about innovations. And they'll say, well, that's all very good, but what does it tell us about Apawapaskat? What does this tell us about missing Aboriginal women? And I will be left, frankly, with an answer which is a very uncomfortable place to be if you're from the classroom. And I'll be left without an answer because it all comes back to the topic of tonight's talk. How do we honor treaties? What does it mean in the very big scale, the relationship between the Crown and the First Nations? What does it mean on a very local scale, here at Regina, on campus, in our community? So, with that, by way of introduction and by way of thanks, I'd like to welcome Bob Ray to the stage to help us answer some of these questions tonight. Um, and I'm told that he's happy to take questions at the end. Uh, should be happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be back in the uh, in Regina. It's wonderful to be uh, to be here in front of uh, a, a very respectable crowd on a. Uh, on a Thursday night. I really appreciate people coming out. Uh, it's good to see so many uh, old friends. Although I'm reminded of uh, George Bernard Shaw's expression when he said, we, we don't stop playing because we're too old. We grow old because we stop playing. <laughs> and uh, I can tell you, for those of you who are wondering, I'm still playing, so I hope you are too. I hope you are too. Uh, <clears throat> well, I... I've been working uh, in this uh, part of Canadian life and Canadian politics for a long time, not just as an academic, uh, not just as a lawyer, uh, not just as a political leader, but at all times in my life going back uh, to uh, my early 30s, which is uh, 36 years ago. Uh, I, I was a member of parliament at the time when the constitution was uh, was patriated. I voted in favor of uh, the patriation and the charter of, of rights and freedoms. Uh, I can vividly remember being in the room with Mr. Trudeau. I was telling a story earlier at dinner tonight and uh, Mr. Broadbent and I were talking to Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Kretschian about the patriation package and about why it needed to, to refer to the historic uh, treaty claims of, of First Nations. And uh, Mr. Trudeau, I, I don't think I've ever told his son this, but his, Mr. Trudeau used to refer to me as Junior. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, well, Junior, what, what, what are the existing treaty rights? And I said, well, you know, being a smart, Alephi, 31-year-old member of parliament, I said, well, what does freedom of assembly mean? What does is, what is freedom of speech mean? We don't, we don't know exactly what it means, but we know that it's sufficiently important as a part of our national life to, to be included in our constitution, and so it needs to be respected, and then will be interpreted as time goes on by the Supreme Court of Canada. So what I want to talk to you tonight, and I, I've been warned by my wife not to read my speech because the, the top of my head is much less interesting than my eyes, so she says. <laughs> I think it's always been an interesting way of looking at things. But what I want to talk to you tonight is is really a, a, a very simple theme, and, and if I divert from it, you will your, your eyes will glaze over, and I'll be able to notice. 
notice that. You'll start twitching in your seats and I'll notice that as well. It's really about an historic contrast that's grown up over a period of time. So I'm going to take you a little bit through the course of recent Canadian history. I'm going to talk a little bit about the law. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about where are we today in this province, in my province of Ontario, in Manitoba, and, and in Alberta in particular, where we find ourselves uh, in treaty territory. And we find First Nations leaders telling us that we need to honor the treaties. And we find governments saying, oh, we're honoring them. And we need to understand that tension. And the thing that I've learned in, in, in life, and certainly in politics, is that people often use the same words, but they often mean very different things when they use those words. And so people aren't communicating with each other when they use these words. So let me start, start the story at the beginning. And ironically, it starts just before I went to law school. There was a case called the Calder case, which went to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Calder case was really about the Nisca people in British Columbia, who insisted that because there was no treaty in their part of British Columbia, that they still had titles to the land that they had something called Aboriginal title. The argument of the Crown had always been that with settlement came the extinguishment of title. In fact, in earlier times, the doctrine was that Canada, like all of the Americas was called in Latin terra nullius, meaning the land of no one, the land where no one lived. So the legal implication of that is, well, finders keepers. We turn up, it's our land. So that was the theory of Cortez and Pizarro and Columbus and everyone else. There was nobody here. Well, actually there were several million people here in the Americas. The time that Columbus came, and they now estimate that there were millions of people in North America, over two million people living in North America. There were millions and millions more south of the south of here. And those people were people who lived and worked the land for thousands of years. And they had cultures and civilizations and languages and ways of life and governments and everything else that's required to be, <laughs> to exercise jurisdiction. But they lost in a brutal conquest. And they also lost to disease, and they lost out to illness, and they lost out to being completely marginalized to the point that we estimate that at the time of Confederation, there were probably somewhere between 100 and 150,000 indigenous peoples still alive in, in Canada, from one coast to the other. And so to bring us up to date, the Calder case came as a complete shock to the federal government. Because it's a complicated decision, there's a bunch of different judges and their concurrent opinions, but the thrust of what was decided in the Calder case was this. The judgment said, before settlers came, there were people here. And they must have had title because 
They worked the land. They lived on the land. They walked on the land. They hunted the land. They, they were here. And they had title. Now, being a court, I don't want to offend any judges in the room or even retired ones. They also said, but, you know, but we're not quite sure what, you know, whether they, they really did have all the time they said they had. That has to be discussed and negotiated and da 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 But it was a, a radical decision from the perspective of Canadian public policy because for the first time, the court said there's something called title here. And the First Nations have it. And it hasn't been because there's no treaty. Federal government, five years later, that's been, in, in federal government time, that's like lightning speed, <laughs> developed a comprehensive land claims policy and began to this process of deep and thorough discussion that went on and has gone on since the late 1970s to deal with this question of, of claims. And so we've seen this exciting development across the country where major jurisdictional transformations have taken place. We have, as Canadians, created a brand new territory, Nunavut. We've seen the negotiation of major, huge <coughs> land claims and self-government agreements in Yukon, in Northwest Territories, in Labrador, in Quebec, and in British Columbia, which have led to huge transfers of land and jurisdiction and political responsibility and money. Major transfers of money and responsibility and jurisdiction to First Nations people that are beginning to have a truly transformative effect in all of those parts of the country. So if you imagine a map of the country, starting in Labrador, <coughs> where the Innu have now had several agreements which have led to their transformation, plus the resource development that's taking place with the Boise mine and so on, there's been huge industrial benefit agreements that have been signed. The government of Newfoundland and Labrador has agreed to transfer resource revenues to groups that have been self-government agreements with the Innu as well as with the Nuviala. Similarly, I've mentioned in Nunavut, you have not only the creation of a new territory, which is obviously self-governing, you have the land claims agreement with the uh, Inuit Tupirisat, which has been major, huge, transformative. In Northwest Territories, you have a similar scale of, of agreements, and in Yukon, the same thing. <laughs> And of course, the Calder case, which came out of the Nisca territory, eventually produced the, the Nisca Land Claims Agreement, which was passed by the House of Commons after a bitter fight where the Reform Party was completely opposed, led by Mr. Manning, but is now the law of Canada, a treaty that's been accepted, a modern-day treaty. So what's wrong with this story? What's wrong with the story is, is that there's now a huge gap between the self-governing capacity of the First Nations living in the modern treaties and those people living under the historic treaties, the number treaties, which have been referred to already. Those treaties were signed in a very different era. They were signed at a time of expansion of the country, soon after Confederation. And they were signed at a time when people living in Ottawa and in London and in Washington and in Paris, by the way, take you back to the late 19th century, had a very particular view about race and imperialism 
and who was better than who. And we have to understand that to, to appreciate what these, what these number treaties were in comparison and in contrast to the treaties that we've been negotiating in recent days. Because we're dealing with an era when you had three major aspects of policy, if I can put it that way, towards indigenous people. The first were the treaties, the number treaties. The second was the Indian Act. And the third was residential schools. And they all come within a 40-year period of our history. Between the late, between the mid-1870s and the early 1920s. And at that time, among settler opinion, white opinion, European or orientated opinion, there was a very clear view about the world. Not just Canada, but about the world. White people were better than everybody else, according to this view. They were superior. They were born to rule. You can't understand the expansion into Africa or the expansion into Asia of the British Empire, the French Empire. You can't understand the drive of the American Empire West unless you understand that the fundamental worldview that drove this expansion was racialist in its orientation. And it was based as well, it, had, it, it was connected in this kind of terrible cocktail that was developed in the late 19th century to the theories of Charles Darwin. Not that Darwin himself would have prescribed this theory, but, but what, what Darwin talked about was how evolution allowed for a dynamic process of change. And to coin a phrase in which things evolved, species evolved, it was taken by a British social scientist named Herbert Spencer to describe something a little different called the survival of the fittest. Darwin never used the phrase the survival of the fittest, but Spencer did. And when Spencer applied this idea, it was immediately taken up to me, well, we survive better, therefore, we're the fittest, we're better. So whether it was in Africa, or whether it was in Asia, or whether it was in Canada, the view was, Europeans are born to rule, and other people are born to be ruled. The commonest assumption of our Victorian ancestors was that indigenous people would die out. They would either physically die, or they would simply assimilate and disappear. So, to understand the treaties, it's a hard thing to say, it's a hard thing to come to grips with this, but we have to come to grips with this. This is part of the truth process that's re required before we can we can do the reconciliation part, which is, which is difficult in itself. The truth part tells us that we have to understand what happened. What people were thinking when they negotiated treaties from the government perspective. And what their objective really was. Everyone in Saskatchewan knows instinctively what the objective of the treaties was. The objective of the treaties was to clear the plains. It was to get First Nations and Aboriginal people off the land. It was to confine them to a smaller space. And it was to allow for the possibilities of settlement and colonization and expansion. That's what it was all about. Same thing is true in Ontario, my province, Treaty Number 9. It was all about expanding the scope of colonial activity so that the resources could be developed in Northern Ontario. It was all about making sure that you didn't have any pesky claims or people who were there to kind of challenge a development of a mine or development of the, of the forest industry. 
and to allow the railway to be established and to go across. That's what it was all about from the point of view of public policy. What was the Indian Act designed to do, which happened in tandem and in connection with the treaties? The Indian Act was intended to confine Aboriginal settlement to the smallest possible place to restrict movement and residential schools, which is the third part of the puzzle, residential schools were intended to take kids away from their parents so that they would not remain as Indians. So they would become like white people. Or not make it. Throw them in the deep end of the pool, see who can swim. And give the churches the job of executing this task. It's not a pretty picture, folks. It's not a happy story. But it's part of our story. And we have to understand it to understand the nature of the challenge. So I've described what the objective from public policy terms was of the treaties. But it's important to understand what the treaties meant to the people who were signing the treaties from the indigenous perspective. Well, partly it depends on where you were, but if you were in Western Canada, you were being starved into submission. Because the basis of the Plains Indians' way of life was the hunt, and was the buffalo, and was the ability to move around the land and to have access to as much land as possible. Because that was your home. Your home was not confined to a reservation of 20 square miles. Your home was the whole prairie. And so when we say, well, you signed an agreement that says you cede, release, and surrender any claim that you have to the land, there's a couple of things we have to think about. First of all, who could speak English? Who could speak English? Who could actually read? And what was the worldview of indigenous people at the time? The worldview was, and we know this from so many of the elders teaching so much of what they've said, the worldview was quite simple. The land doesn't, we don't own the land. There's no fee simple in the land. We don't divide up the land and say, this is mine and this is yours. We have traditional territories that belong to one tribe or group or another. But the land itself belongs to the Creator. And we are the stewards of the land. We don't own the land. So this completely European notion that somehow the land, you know, this is my square plot of land, this is my land, that's your land, and you know, you can't, you can't, you know, you, you have this, uh, this is mine and yours, doesn't, doesn't fit. So the premise, the legal premise of the treaties is, in my view, something that we need to question and understand the problem. There are three ways of looking at the treaties. The first way is to say that they mean what they say. So the wording of the treaties is what they mean. And so the premise is therefore, you had all this land, you, have, you might have had, you might have had title of all to thousands and thousands of square miles of land, but you exchange that for these tiny, tiny reserves and five dollars a year. That's the deal that you made. Well, if you're a lawyer, you look at that and you say, well, how could anybody have arrived at that deal? What kind of a deal is that? 
The second possibility is that we have to respect the oral tradition which says the First Nations believed that they were simply sharing the land. And the entire premise of First Nations communities is that they never believed they were giving it up. They never, they never believed that when they signed the agreements. They never believed they were giving up their claim to being part of the land. They could never do that. What the elders say is, no, we believe we were sharing the land. And there's actually one case, a legal case called Paulette, in the Northwest Territories, where a judge, Judge Morrow, who was a very famous judge of the Northwest Territories, judge of Alberta, judge of Northwest Territories, actually heard the case, he heard the case in the, in the, uh, in, in the, in the 70s, and in, in hearing the case, there were actually a lot of elders who, who could actually recount stories from their, from their parents. It was that close in time. And so they could actually say, well, you know, my father never believed that. And Judge Morrow said, you know, you, you, you're probably right. And we have to respect the oral tradition. So he blew up a lot of the federal case. And as a result of that case, the federal government never appealed that decision, never went to the Court of Appeal, never went to the Supreme Court of Canada. They just said, okay, we'll start to discuss. You'll be part of the land claims agreements. We'll, we'll start to talk about this with you. The third possibility, from a legal point of view, is the courts always say, well, you have to assume there was a meeting of minds. When two people come together and sign something, you have to assume that they're agreeing on what they're signing. The third possibility is logically is to say, actually, no, actually, no, there was no meeting of minds. In the case of Treaty 9 in Ontario, this, this, I'm not exaggerating when I say this is what happened. Over a period of two years, the government of Ontario and the government of Canada negotiated what would be in Treaty 9. They then wrote it down and they put it in a very nice, like, you know, parchment and everything. The whole thing was like drawn up beautifully. They appointed three treaty commissioners, including the now notorious uh, Duncan Campbell Scott. And they went by train and by boat to Northern Ontario. And elders and others would be, would be invited to a meeting. And they'd come at Osnaburg or Fort Hope or any of the large trading communities where there were trading places. And the elders would come in and they'd have a night where they'd say, we're here to negotiate and sign a treaty. We'd like you to sign. Your great mother in England will take care of you for all time and everything will be well and we'll respect you, all your rights. And, you know, a couple of chiefs would say, well, you know, what's the catch? Like, you know, the transcripts from the discussion show that, well, well, there must be a catch. No, there's no catch. Nobody, by the way, except for the translators, nobody spoke English. And they wouldn't sign it. They didn't actually sign the treaty. They simply put their hand on the pen. And the X would be marked. And it would be marked next to a name. And they'd say, well, now we have a deal. Negotiated over, over a period of an afternoon and evening and then the signing in the morning. You couldn't sell a vacuum cleaner that way in any commercial agreement. So if you say there was no meeting of minds, well then you say, well, there's no treaty, but we have a problem. Because for the First Nations, the treaties are important. You can't have a discussion with First Nations communities that doesn't come back to saying you must honor the treaty. Problem we have is that the Crown says we're honoring the treaty. You guys gave up the land. You released and surrendered the land. And so the Crown, the Provincial Crown, has taken over. The Provincial Crown has moved in. So we're the Ministry of Natural Resources, we're the Ministry of Mines, we're the Ministry of, of this and that, and we have total jurisdiction. We are the Crown. We have jurisdiction on behalf of all the people in our province. 
And so what's happened is this. When you start to compare how are people doing in the old historic treaties, in the old historic treaty provinces of Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and you compare that to what's happening in the rest of the country, you have this gap that's growing. And it's not just a, a legal gap or a jurisdictional gap, it's a real gap in terms of well-being. Because the James Bay Cree, they have a government, they have revenues, they have responsibility for schools, they have responsibilities for health care, they have responsibilities for for advancing the interests of the people, they have infrastructure being developed, they have roads. Compare the situation in northern Ontario, northern Manitoba, northern Saskatchewan. There's no comparison. It's not prepared to change. Not prepared to negotiate jurisdiction. Not prepared to negotiate revenue share. Premier, Premier Wallace said, no, no revenue share. We won't share revenue with any stakeholder group. Well, imagine how you feel if you're a First Nations person. Say, stakeholder group? We were here long before anybody else was here. We shared the land with you. And now you're telling us we can't get any of the revenue from the development of that land. So this is what this is the challenge that we face. And this is, I think, the greatest challenge that we face as a country. I, I have long felt that's what Charlottetown was all about and what it tried to do. It's what we've never really been able to come to terms with. This is the final reconciliation that now needs to happen. And it has to be based on a sharing of power and authority and jurisdiction and wealth and opportunity. It cannot be based on dependency. And it cannot be based on handouts. And it can't be based on saying you have to be like us. It can't be based on assimilation. Because all of those things have completely and totally failed. And so, we're, in my view, we're left with, with, with a way forward. But it's politically very difficult. For a whole bunch of reasons. But saying it's difficult is no reason to stop trying. And it's no reason to abandon what is the most logical path. Even if you're an inveterate right winger, you have to ask yourself the question, if people have no stake in prosperity, why would they embrace the path of development? We've tried dependency. We've tried assimilation. We've tried marginalization. We've tried powerlessness. And none of them have worked. None of them have worked. We have to try a different path. There's now an additional element that I think is changing the dynamic in the country. And it's really twofold. When I was growing up, and you can appreciate from looking at the color of my hair, that was well, some would say it's a process that still hasn't completed itself. <laughs> Aboriginal people were out there somewhere. I lived in, grew up in Ottawa. Never saw an Aboriginal person, ever. And it was the frontier was out there. It was, it was you know, cowboys and Indians in different parts of our history, whatever. But it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't real. Two things have changed now. The first is that we're in the middle of a continuing demographic revolution. 
John Ralston Saul has just written a book called The Comeback, which I, I commend to you as a book, it just came out this week. And he points out that what was a small, tiny population base at the time of Confederation has continued to expand and explode. The fastest growing population in Canada. Population that is now, well the official number is 1.4 million, but the real number is well over 2 million. And I say the real number because there were so many ways in which people were denied the ability to hold on to their Aboriginal identity. So many ways in which they were told that, well, if you if you married here or left there, whatever you did, you were gone. So the Indian Act was designed to basically eliminate the Aboriginal population over time. It didn't work. And that population is coming into cities. The urbanization of the First Nations population is a huge and dramatic development of our time. And the people of Saskatchewan know this better than anybody. But I see it all over Northern Ontario. I see it in Toronto. We have the fast, we have the largest Aboriginal community in the country lives, lives in Toronto. So that's the first thing. A younger, vibrant population is coming to urban Canada. And it isn't going to stop. It isn't suddenly going to just say, well, that's, that's done now. It's going to grow. And it was the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People who pointed this out 25 years ago. They said, this is happening. People said, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. It's happening in a big way. And if you have a racialist view or a racist view of life, that's, you say, well, that's very worrisome. I say, no, no, it's, it's a cause for celebration. It's Canada coming home to itself. And the second thing that's happening is that the the resource frontier of the country is moving north. It's moving west. It's moving to where the traditional territory of the Aboriginal people really is. And so, even if you wanted to pretend this is not something we need to deal with as a country, if you were a smart guy in the oil and gas business or in the forestry business or in the mining business, you'd say, I'd better get my head around this question. Because these are the people who live here and they're going to be working here and this is their land, this is their territory. And the third factor is the Supreme Court of Canada. And it all goes back to the Calder case and it all goes back to the decision that was made to include Section 35 in the Patriotic Constitution. And it all goes back to Chief Justice Dixon, who said, okay, Parliament, you told us that we have to recognize the existing treaty rights. We better figure out what the heck they are. And so ever since 1983 and 4, we've had a range of decisions that have said, this is what it means. It means you have to accommodate. It means you have to consult. It means you have to respect. It means there's something called the honor of the crown. The crown cannot be seen to be disrespecting the legitimacy of this relationship. And so even if a poll is taken and 85% of Canadians say, we don't really care about, it's not a priority for us. I'm sorry, Canada, this is a priority. It's just become a priority. And it's unfinished business. And nowhere in the country is this going to be more critical than in Western Canada. Nowhere. Because this has always been part of the history of Western Canada. It's always been part of this relationship. And so I conclude I always say that to people start to get relieved when I use the word. <laughs> I conclude by saying to all of you, I left partisan politics. Sometimes I, I had to leave it not entirely voluntarily. <laughs> Other times I've left it voluntarily, although sometimes reluctantly. And there are many parts of partisan politics that I, that I enjoyed and that I miss. But I still think there's room for engagement 
by all of us as Canadian citizens in understanding that this is a critical issue for our time. And while governments may not want to respond to it, or may not always be able to respond to it, it doesn't mean that we don't have to. And so the agenda means not ignoring the treaties, or pretending they're not there, or minimizing them, but understanding the following. There has to be an agenda on self-government. There has to be an agenda on empowerment. There has to be an agenda on revenue sharing. There has to be an agenda on education. There has to be an agenda on housing. And yes, there has to be an agenda on what is the urban future for the First Nations people of our country. And these, all of our political parties, have to address. And if they ignore them, it's at our collective peril. Because the fact is that unlocking the resource wealth of the country and unlocking the human potential of the country really depends on our ability to face up to these questions and not to ignore them. So this is a challenge that we all face, whether we're conservatives or liberals or Democrats or Greens, whatever political persuasion we may have, we can't let the political parties off the hook. We have to get them to address these issues. And we have to be prepared to address them, whether it's provincially or federally. That, I believe, is the path ahead for us as a country. And it's certainly the path ahead for the province of Saskatchewan. Thank you very much. So if you have a question, uh, please come forward. I'd be glad to, uh, to answer it. The only thing I've been warned is uh, to discourage other forms of speech making. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Good evening. Um, I'm just wondering if you are familiar with the uh, specifics of the Luke Concrete. Over time, I have, I have followed it, and yes, I'm... I'm I'm uh, reasonably familiar with uh, some of the issues and debates, yeah. Well, as you are no doubt aware then, this has gone on for decades, and of course it involves a tribe that has no treaty. Right. And um, I'm just wondering if you see any progress, if you're optimistic about the possibility of uh, a fair agreement happening in that particular uh, dispute. I think it's very difficult because I think the I think the federal government, I, I mean, I think the issue there will be, if it ever gets litigated further, will be this issue of the honor of the crown. Because I think both the federal and provincial government have been very tough in, in trying to get around uh, some of the governance issues. We're saying, well, this group of people is not very cooperative, so we're going to go off and talk to a smaller group and, and so on. So if you say to me, am I very optimistic? My answer would be, uh, I'm not unrealistically optimistic. But I, it needs to be done. Sir. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm from North Battleford. Uh, I've been a chief of my community, been a councillor for uh, quite a long time. I'm here on an education purpose. And um, regarding oil, oil history, we'll talk about uh, yeah. the Algerman case. Yes. Or oil, oil history for First Nations elders. Yes was permissible in, in courts. I had the opportunity to, um, to then to discuss um, and uh, also teach, get teachings from my elders and a lot, a lot of my old, older people. I've always said that the, uh, the treaties are uh, not being fulfilled, especially for in minerals. Um, they always said that uh, baby word, the baby word is just used uh, it's unfinished business uh, for the minerals. But, uh, the, our old people said that we were um, uh, we welcomed the newcomers. We shared the land. We agreed to share the land, but we also didn't, didn't forgive, uh, didn't give up the minerals. We gave up. We agreed to. They said the depth of the land, six inches. 
anything below is ours. Can you explain on that? Thank you. Well, I think it's I think it's a perfectly legitimate point. Uh, I think the argument on on behalf of many First Nations is, is that they they agreed to share the land and they agreed to welcome uh, settlers up to a point, but they never agreed to give up uh, jurisdiction over the development of the land. That was never part of the deal. Uh, the problem always is the contrast between the oral interpretation and memory uh, and what's actually written down. And what is actually written down is that what we know was in the mind of the Crown. We know that we know what the Crown was thinking. The Crown was thinking all the way through, how do we get these people off the land and how do we get jurisdiction in place so that we can develop the land? In Ontario, it's very clear. We know that they wanted the land for resource purposes. They wanted it for, for uh, timber licenses and for mining development. We know that. And we know that the Crown asserted that as soon as the treaties were signed. In the case of Alberta and Saskatchewan, it's a little more Manitoba, it's a little more complicated because the treaties were signed, not in the case of Manitoba, but certainly in the case of Saskatchewan and Alberta, the treaties were, were signed before they became provinces. So, and, and they didn't get full resource rights until even later in the, in, in the, in the game, until 1930. So, they the provinces say, you know, we, we're simply taking on the responsibilities of the crown and we're exercising the development of the minerals and development of the oils and development of the gas. I think the, the, the issue is, is going to come back down to this, this question of you have two different interpretations and the answer has got to be negotiation. The answer has got to be a reconciliation between these two views. And that's what needs to happen. But the problem is getting provincial governments and the federal government to say, yeah, that's what it means. We understand, we understand the difference of opinion. And we accept the fact that there's got to be some revenue transfer. But we have this problem with the Crown. In my province, in, in every province, the provincial Crown just says, it's ours. We're, you know, we're not going to give it up. Now, Quebec has agreed to revenue sharing. BC has agreed to revenue sharing. In my own province of Ontario, the Premier has agreed to discuss revenue sharing. I'm part of that negotiation in the Ring of Fire. So that's a bit of a, a, bit of a, a breakthrough. But it's not, a, it's, it's not clear exactly where that's going to take us. But in the case of Saskatchewan, and, and the the premier has said no, there would be no revenue sharing. And in Alberta, the new premier may 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 come to agree now to sit down and talk with some of the the bands that are affected by oil development. We'll see what that means. But you know, Mr. Prentice certainly knows the issue well. He, he, he was a lawyer who negotiated on behalf of First Nations, and he was the minister of, of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. So we'll see if that leads to any change. Sir, yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ray, uh, for the uh, presentation and, and my capacity as a member of the Treaty 4, uh, as a Treaty 4 citizen. Welcome to Treaty 4. Thank you. Thank you for, for being with us this evening. Uh, you, you've kind of uh, answered the question that I had, and uh, I'd just like you to expound on this if, if you can. Uh, governments of all stripes, at least uh, in my experience, and see have raised expectations in forming new relationships with First Nations. The expectations are raised so high and they're never met. The governments have a tendency to go back to the basic or bare minimum of treaty fulfillment, uh, as they understand. So there's this meeting of the minds that you talked about that hasn't been achieved. What advice would you give to governments or citizens uh, in this area on how to get to, to a, a a meaningful engagement in the meeting of minds. I think. I think. What in, in in my argument, what I've tried to point out is that the answer is based on what actually has happened in the rest of the country. 
In other words, we're not asking Saskatchewan or Manitoba or Ontario to do anything other than what has already taken place in British Columbia and Quebec and, and uh, Labrador and Northwest Territories, Yukon. I mean, look at those agreements. And increasingly, First Nations have to say, you know, look, here, here's, here's the bar. Here's, here's where the standard is now been set. Here's what self-government means. Here's what revenue sharing means. Are we less? Are we to be less equal than our fellow Aboriginal people just because they happen to be living in a territory and not in a province? Is that the logic now to say, well, you know, because we live here and we don't live further north, we're we're not going to get the benefit of self-government? There's no logic to that. And then, if the argument then turns around, the problem says, yeah, but you guys signed a treaty. You then have to go back to the basics of what's fair and say, well, you're not seriously suggesting that the same people who brought you residential schools and the same people who brought you the Indian Act are going to be the standard for a, a modern 21st century government as to how you treat First Nations people. That can't possibly be the same. That can't be right. Now, I have no idea whether this argument would work in court or not. I don't know. But I do know that, <clears throat> I suspect it could. But I also know that it's, not, it's really not a very good use of our time to spend the next 10 or 15 or 20 years litigating this issue. The point is for us to achieve greater clarity of objective. And I think there's been a lot of if you'll pardon me, woolly talk, as opposed to very specific talk. The treaties were the product of a particular era in our history. And as much as the First Nations say, honor the treaties, there also has to be a realistic attack on saying, how could the, the settler interpretation of the treaties possibly be correct? Because it came from a time when there was absolutely no intention of recognizing First Nations people as a people. None whatsoever. They didn't think First Nations people could understand it. They thought they were just savages. Sir John McDonald used the phrase savages to describe First Nations people. So we can't let that stand as our test. Our test has to be, well, when in modern times, when people have gotten together to say, how do we share the land effectively, what did they try to do? And that's the argument that I would make on behalf of Treaty 4 or Treaty 6 or Treaty 8 or Treaty 9 or Treaty 1 or 2 or 3, any one of them. That's the argument we have to use, is to say, we can't use the Victorian standard of government to determine the nature of the relationship between First Nations people and their governments, because it comes out of a period, it, it comes out of a colonial period. We have to decolonize this relationship. Yep. Welcome to Treaty 4. My name is Brad Belgard, and I am a student from the First Nations University of Canada. I had a whole bunch of questions to ask you, but then they get answered every once in a while. So I'm gonna throw in a new one, a fresh one that just came to my head while I was standing here. We have, um, you mentioned section 35. Yeah. Right to fishing, right to logging, right to land. Um, that still places indigenous people, First Nations people specifically under the scope of the Aboriginal and Northern Development, North Indian Affairs, pretty much. Um, there's a lot of discussion back and forth whether we take away the Indian Act, abolish the Indian Act, let's get rid of it. It needs to be, we need to have some kind of structure in order to be able to replace that Indian Act with something. Yes. In your opinion, what would be an acceptable um, replacement for that document, that form of policy? I'm um, keeping in mind honoring the treaties, and I just want to go on record here as saying it is always left out in the discussion of the treaties. When the treaties were signed, it was a nation-to-nation -nation basis. And it was, every treaty was signed with, in the presence of a pipe. The pipe is a sacred object. 
That means it's binding, and the spirit and intent comes from the heart. It's the truth that was spoken. So I just want to go on record to say that because it's not documented in the written text. It's documented in oral tradition. And how would we re how would we go about replacing the Indian Act with something that honors the treaties and keeps that spirit and intent alive? In your opinion, thank you. Well, that's, a big, that's a big question. Very good question. The last time a government tried to get rid of the Indian Act was Mr. Was Mr. Trudeau's government in 1968 with the White Paper, which was rejected out of hand, rejected very quickly by the Aboriginal leadership. I think that came as a total surprise to, to the government of the day, um, but it, it, it's what happened. So we're not going to we're not going to try that again. Uh, whatever happens has to be negotiated. But in my view. And I, I, I don't mean to say this uncharitably to anybody here who works for the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development, as it now is, is that department should be blown up. Uh, and, and I, say that, I say that because it really is a classic colonial administration. It's based on, out of Ottawa, running hundreds of thousands of, of square miles of territory, uh, and dividing up into little jurisdictions the reserve structure, and the reserve structure is not really sustainable as it is currently constituted. It isn't sustainable. So we need to find new ways of self-government that go beyond the reserve structure, uh, that look at how, how do we create more effective units of self-government, more effective jurisdiction of self-government. Now, I'm going to be very candid. This is not easy to do because the, the genius of the Indian Act, if you like, is that you've given a lot of the native leadership a very strong stake in the current structure, which is not sustainable. But it's sustainable for them because it works for them. But you say this is going to work for the whole people. So there has to be a really candid discussion inside First Nations communities to say, if we were to take the money out of out of Indian affairs, out of Aboriginal affairs. And if we were to reallocate those budgets, and if we were to give First Nations people the responsibility for those budgets, what would be the units of governance that we would use? Would it be 300 people or 200 people? Or No, I don't think it would be. I think it would be bigger units of self-government, bigger regional units that would have real responsibility. This is a process of negotiation. We called for it in Charlottetown. That was part of the Charlottetown Accord that we would have self-government negotiations in every, in every province that this would take place. It hasn't happened. Uh, and there's been no momentum for it. But we have to rediscover that momentum. And ultimately, I think at that point, the, the Indian Act could disappear and the department could disappear and the jurisdiction and responsibility will be clearly held by the people who in whose interest these things are supposed to be done. Um, and and it's, it's, it's got to happen. It's, it's begun happening. The process is gradual. But it has to, we have to move to self-government in, in our country just as surely as, as every former colony of England or France has moved to self-government and greater control over its jurisdiction. One of the strangest comments that Mr. Harper has ever made was when he said that Canada has no history of colonialism. <laughs> Canada not only has a history of colonialism, it has the current experience of colonialism. And that is the experience that we're trying to come to grips with and trying to bring to a conclusion. This is the last vestige of the imperial experience. And we still have, we haven't even been able to identify it as such. Let's say this is what it is. We've got to get rid of it. Because it does terrible things to people. It does terrible things to people who are on the receiving end. And what, by the way, it also does terrible things to people who are, who are giving it out. And that's been true for every colonial experience the world has ever known. It corrupt, it corrupts everybody. And that's the problem with it. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, I, I just wanted to talk about your, your talk about self uh, self government self determination, um, and that was partially my question. 
was how is this possible? And without having, you know, I guess uh, uh, problems in the governments as far as the First Nations governments across Canada. So there is, uh, you know, some issues as far as uh, who represents who, as far as that goes, and the difficulties surrounding that to be able to come together to be able to have self-government and self-determination. And I know you were talking about that, and you did answer those questions in, in some ways, but is it even possible in that way to be able to get everybody together to collect them, to be able to have this you know, national uh, government to be able to reflect uh, other benefits of First Nations? Well, you know, it, it's first of all, let's not make it more complicated than, than it really is. I mean, it is complicated, but it's not impossible. Other other parts of the world have done it. The Maoris have done it. New Zealand, effectively, in a variety of ways, not perfect, but they've certainly moved beyond where we are today. Um, and you know, there's a variety of ways in which it can be done, and a lot of possibilities. But until you start to explore those possibilities and have those discussions, I guarantee you, it will never happen. But it will only happen if we start having the discussion. I mean, what's happened in James Bay is that they they started, it, it was an evolutionary process. They started out with local reserves under the Indian Act coming together and for some purposes agreeing to bargain together and work together. And then eventually they've created now a regional government which includes non-Aboriginal people and Aboriginal people, which is what you have in Nunavut. You have a territorial government, which is not defined by ethnic or race or anything else, or, or Aboriginal identity or anything. And then you have the Inuit to Pierce Act, which has its own responsibilities for the Inuit. So there are lots of possibilities. This has to change. I mean, it's ridiculous that it doesn't change. The things turning up on the minister's desk in Ottawa, saying, you know, what's going to happen in, a, in deciding on, you know, how many schools are going to get built in places that are thousands and thousands of miles away from where the minister lives, it's absurd. Why, why would we put up with that today? Why would we expect people to put up with it? Yeah. Uh, schools in Saskatchewan being teaching treaty is a high priority, and uh, it's much different teaching Aboriginal history than it was when we were children. Yeah. In your opinion, what is one thing you want uh, today's Canadian school children to know about uh, treaties? Well, I think you're right. I, mean, I, think, I think you made a very important point. That is, you know, we, this is a part of a part of something that needs to happen. But I think everyone agrees. But should every, I think most people agree that we have we have to change the curriculum throughout the country, throughout the school systems, so that everybody can embrace and understand the the nature of the Canadian experience, and, and that is something, I think, very different. I, I think you tell the truth about the trees. I think you say, this is what the white people thought they were doing, and this is what the Aboriginal people thought they were doing, and that's how we got the treaties. And that's why somebody can stand up and say the treaties are not being respected and honored, and somebody else can say uh, the life of the treaties is not being respected, and some uh, lawyer working for the federal government or for the provincial government will say, we're doing exactly what we said we would do. We, we, we said we'd take over the land, that's what we did. We said we'd pay them five bucks a year, we've been doing it every year since 1905. You know, we've lived up to them. Yep. Good evening, Mr. Ed. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Um, you talk about self-government, but among First Nations, the term isn't used as much as self-determination. And I think it's important for people to know the difference between the two. And if you could speak a little bit about that, the, the difference between self-government and self-determination. Uh, the second question I have is, what is the largest or the biggest danger that First Nations are facing politically, socially, economically, with respect to the government, current federal government that's in power? <laughs> I think the phrase self-determination uh, has a lot of resonance in First Nations communities because it's, it speaks to a broader sense of, uh, of sovereignty and empowerment than self-government. I think the phrase self-government often perhaps has the, has the sense of being 
another level of government within within a, a confined you know jurisdiction. Uh, I think self determination gives people a greater sense of of, uh, of empowerment. I think the reality will be somewhere in between those two because I think it's the reality is going to be that that there will there will be uh, on the part of of other governments there will be an insistence of transparency. Uh, Compatibility with the existing laws of Canada, and how do we compare and you know and contrast and make sure people's rights are being respected? And that's part of the give and take of the discussion, the dialogue that needs to that needs to happen. Um, I think Mr. Harper uh, has done the minimum, uh, and I think that you know to understand the Harper government's position, you have to go back and read the debates that happened around the time of the NISCA Treaty and the platform of the Reform Party in Canada. And I think that's fundamentally where Mr. Harper's government is, and that is to do as little as possible, because they don't believe that the reserve structure is, is the least bit sustainable. They want people to leave reserve. They want people to get out of their communities. They want people to come into the cities and to be like everybody else. And that's what they want, and that's what they hope will happen. And the way they're setting it out, it won't happen. Um, it won't happen because there's too strong an attachment on the part of First Nations people to the land and to their relationship to the land, even when they move into cities. And secondly, because it's, an, it's a denial of, of the fundamental relationship between First Nations people and, and the governments of Canada and the Crown. And that is the relationship which the court has upheld and that Mr. Harper's party has consistently refused to recognize it really exists. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Robel Sell, the business grant. Um, in regards to the foreign investment protections agreement that was just signed last month, um, what does that mean when there is a foreign investor now at the table can overstep certain treaties or overstep and legally sue the Canadian government if their foreign investments are being challenged. Um, what does that mean in terms of uh, for, the, for the next generation of, of relationships between Canada and First Nations Aboriginal people? And if so, um, how does Canada get technically back on the right track or the correct path of relationship after a 30-year-long binding agreement has just been signed last month? I, I actually don't agree that FIPA represents a fundamental challenge to the Canadian constitutional structure or to the potential self-determination of Aboriginal people. I actually don't believe that. I think I think it's, that's a misconstruction of what FIPA is. Uh, FIPA says that investors are entitled to protection under the law. Fine, they're entitled to protection under the law. What's the law? Uh, if you agree with me, and I think with the Supreme Court in substantial ways, the law is that there's a duty to consult and accommodate, and the First Nations people have rights, and they have rights which must be respected. And they have to be respected by foreign investors as much as they have to be respected by domestic investors. So I think a lot of the rhetoric around FIPA is actually exaggerated. That's my own view. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. A. Um, you talked a lot about the Charlottetown Accords, the Constitution of 1982, and things of that nature. You have to so, forgive me, it's a little bit of a stroll down memory lane, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep in mind some of the other aspects of those uh, meetings and those uh, legislational bills, uh, multiculturalism, um, some of the things as it pertains to Quebec and that society. As informed citizens, future legislators, and professionals in Canada here, how do we go about electing a responsible government that's going to take into account all of these other interests, interests that may seem competing at times <laughs> as it pertains to honoring the treaties of Aboriginal peoples? Well, I think, I think, we, I think that, you know, it, it, Canada's, it's never been perfect, it's never been easy. Uh, there's a very strong, yeah, a whole variety of things. In fact, you know, one of the reasons Charlottetown failed was because there was so much in it, people said, well, I don't like that part, so I'm going to vote against it. So, you know, it was just, it was, it was, it, it was, it, it was, we just couldn't get to a, a referendum of success. But I, I do think that, that the, the key to understanding the Canadian Constitution is that our democracy is not a populist democracy. 
Our democracy is based on the rule of law. And it's based on the protection of minorities. And it's based on people other than the majority. And it's based on a sense of the legitimacy of our democracy stemming from that. And I think that's a very important feature of our Constitution. And I'm quite confident that that's a view that will be upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada. I also think it should be upheld by the government of Canada more often in understanding what the limits to power really are and how power and, and, and uh, authority are sometimes different different ideas. Think, I'll take the last two questions here and that'll be it. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, my question pertains to Métis script and how the Canadian government can fill uh, the agreements or uh, those entitlements to the Métis people. Well, good question. One of the most significant decisions the court has made in recent years is the decision that was made uh, on uh, the question of the Métis and the promises that were made uh, in the 1870s and that were not kept. I mean, uh, a lot of land was supposed to have been set aside for Métis people and was not set aside uh, and, and uh, it never happened. So, you know, that, that, that declaration has now been made by the court and the court has said there's something called the honor of the crown. The crown said something was going to happen. It didn't happen. This is not acceptable. Something that the crown has to remedy. Now, the court didn't order the remedy. The court said, here's the declaration. Now go and fix it. So, uh, you fix it by a combination of land and money and, and jurisdiction. And those are the three things that should be on the table. I, I have not been asked to be their lawyer, but that's what I would say to them. Those are the three issues that have to be settled. And uh, the, the, the problem, you know, the, the problem with some of the court decisions is that the court is, is, is very, is, it took from Calder till Chilcote, which is a 40 year period, for the court to say there is something called Aboriginal title. And then 40 years later they said, oh, and here it is. <laughs> so there's a lot of, you know, the court's not exactly in the, you know, a revolutionary organization. <laughs> they're being very cautious in terms of how they're interpreting the law and how they're moving forward. So the same thing's true for the for the Métis issue. I mean, the court was asked for a declaration, and the court gave a declaration. The court did not do anything more than that. And the court gave some very strong wording, in fact, the strongest wording yet, on what the meaning of this phrase, the honor of the crown, really means. So, the court is doing, in my interpretation of what the court is doing is this, is that the court is saying to governments, listen up, this is, this is what needs to happen. The court is, for, for its own reasons, the court is very reluctant to say, and so we're imposing this solution on you. Because the court does not want to get into the middle of what it believes fundamentally have to be negotiated. And I'm not convinced the court is wrong. I mean, I think sometimes I wish they'd do a little more, but, but I'm not convinced they're wrong. I think, they, I think they're right to say this, it should be negotiated. The problem is, you're asking the majority of governments, federally and provincially, to say, okay, now you've got to act and you've got to negotiate honorably. Well, you know, what the hell does that mean? I mean it's, 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 they'll always, everybody says they're honorable men and honorable people, honorable women. But the honor of the crown has some very specific meaning. It speaks to the fact that there is, as I was saying earlier, there's a difference between, and John Ralston Saul talks about that in his book, there's a difference between power and authority. Power is what you can get away with, what you can do. Authority and legitimacy comes from acting in a way that actually respects all of the rights and all of the things that need to be respected. And that's the tension that we're dealing with. But I would say it's land, it's money, and it's jurisdiction. Those are the three things that need to be on the table in the province of Manitoba. I'll take this to the last question. Hello, um, my name is Benjamin Dietz. I'm a police study student. Um, I hope you take no offense to this question. If you play my professor, Rob Nestor. <laughs> Okay, um, one of the things... Who the hell is Rob Nestor? <laughs> <laughs> well, why didn't the other guts to get up and ask the question? <laughs> Something I've been hearing a lot, I've 
first heard it on a documentary, and then I asked my friends who are First Nations that politicians, they like to talk, but they don't take action. In my case, it really bothers me because I'm on RCMP hopeful. And when I put on that badge, I'm taking a note to protect all the people in Canada, all of them. And one of the things these politicians promise is proper policing on reserves, and they never get it, even though they get elected by these First Nations people. So how do these First Nations people like make these politicians hold true to their word? Like I want to serve the people, all the people, not just a select group of people. Well, it, it, it's a very good question. I mean, a couple of things I would say is I, I don't use the phrase for reasons that these perhaps will appreciate. All politicians are politicians. <laughs> <laughs> As if we're somehow like a people of heart. <laughs> Something in the zoo, you'd have a sign up in the cage. This is, this is a politician, you know. He's not like you and me. <laughs> what politicians do usually reflects public opinion. The problem we face on the Aboriginal issue across the country is that it's a minority concern. It's a concern of a minority of people. Uh, right now, I mean, that's the situation. I'm not saying it should be here, or it's good that it is, I'm just saying it is. So there are many, many ways in which those issues get short shrift. They don't get the attention, they don't get the dollars. What you're describing about, about policing on reserve is exactly the same as education on reserve, health on reserve, uh, roads on reserve, water on reserve, sewage cleanup on reserve, everything on reserve. Reserves do not get what they should get. In fact, there's a case now before the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal where the argument is being made by the First Nations people that child welfare rates, support for families on reserve is much less than it is off reserve, even in neighboring communities. If you're on reserve, you get this much. If you're off reserve, you get this much. And the argument of the crowd is, too bad. Um, we give what we want, they give what they want. The province gives what they want, we give what we want. There's no, you know, it's the way it is. Same thing with policing, too bad. We give the policing budget that we can afford, they give the policing budget they can afford. So it'll be a combination of two things. Um, it'll be public opinion beginning to say this discrimination is wrong because they don't like discrimination, which people should start to say. And the second will be our courts and our human rights tribunals saying it's not acceptable to have two levels of funding. It's discriminatory. Uh, some of that will be handled by politicians. Some of that will be handled by the way the law changes. But however it happens, it needs to happen. Because we do need to create a situation in which there are the same level of services, the same level of funding, the same level of attention being paid to what goes on reserve as to what happens off reserve. And that's what we need to see. That was a good question. Thank you.